welcome this morning uh, to this uh, wonderful occasion uh, of the lecture of Dr. Wendy Lauer. And uh, we are very much looking forward to it. And I, just a few words I would like to say about uh, Dr. Lauer. Uh, she is the John K. Roth uh, Chair of History at um, Claremont McKenney College. And she is also the author of several books, um, very famous, wonderful, well-known books all over the world. And we have invited her now on the occasion of this fantastic book. If you haven't yet read, please buy it and please read it, um, Hitler's Furies. And I think she's now going to take over and she will speak to us about her new research. Thank you very much. Dr. Okay, oh my gosh, this is great. The, this one works, right? And I can move around. And, okay, so happy camper. Um, thank you for coming back for more, those of you who were here last night. Today is gonna be a little bit, um, is gonna go a little bit more differently because um, as Juji mentioned, Professor Osvat, this is a brand new project, and in fact, I told the folks not, this can't go up on the web. <laughs> this presentation can stay in, the, stay in the library, and graduate students can use it. But um, I'm gonna uh, approach the material with a little bit more, more, more open-ended today, and I wanna leave more time for question and answer because I would love to hear from you um, to get your general feedback on this. So this is a book um, that will also probably appear with Houghton, so we'll have a kind of broader audience, um, and I'm, but, but it should, actually uh, be useful, I, my plan is that it'll also be useful to graduate students as more of a methods book, a methodological um, approach to the Holocaust. How do we tell stories about the Holocaust? How do we construct those stories based on what kinds of materials? And what are the challenges of using all these different kinds of materials? Holocaust studies has been really pioneering the last 20 years, more than any field I can think of. Environmental studies right now is starting to move in that direction of doing really interdisciplinary work. I mean, the fact that I will look at books on forensic, um, uh, uh, so, you know, analysis at forensic sites and the landscape of forensics pathology and how do you go to a mass grave site, or I'm looking at poetry of, of, of a Holocaust survivor um, or victim. I mean, the whole range of what we look at, in photographs and films, it's very exciting, but it's also incredibly challenging, and I think that that um, kind of breakthrough for Holocaust studies. We've been, we've been talking about this amongst ourselves, and we really haven't shared that with the rest of the world and with the rest of academic culture, and especially specifically in history programs where people, uh, young people are trying to find their way um, and get their doctorates. Yeah. Um, all right, so a little bit about the subject matter today, and I'm gonna kind of share with you how I'm approaching this. I'm just working this through with my editor right now, and I'm very excited. Um, but I haven't totally thought it through. Again, that's why I want to kind of get your feedback. And so today I'm going to start off with what I think is going to be the hook of the book, the kind of how it's going to be constructed, and then some of the material that I've been collecting um, since 2009 on the Soviet trials against um, mostly Ukrainian policemen. So I'm going to be shifting the focus um, not from women, German women, a um, lot more to do there, but I'm moving on to um, Ukrainian policemen, Ukrainian collaborators, and this very um, complicated question of, of collaboration. Uh, here you see uh, shoes. Now I mentioned that the Holocaust, writing the history of the Holocaust, researching the history of the Holocaust, involves piecing together all these traces in written forms and you know, pay, uh, documents, Nazi documents, film footage, testimonies, and photographs. And photographs are really important, I think, in our day today because we're so visually um, aware, we're so moved by photographs, there's so much a part of how we understand the past and how we relate to one another. So we're in this very visual age. 
And I just, it just struck me with Holocaust photography, which is many of it is what we would call atrocity photography. What does that mean when we're telling stories of the Holocaust through these very shocking photographs? Many of them are not, um, they're very, uh, for the victims, very undignified and raise all kinds of ethical issues about, is this a photograph? As the photo archivist at the USHMM told me this summer when I revealed this photograph to her, she said, I always, ask myself, is that, would I want my grandmother on the internet in that, in that picture? Because I said, what's your policy here for putting things up on the web? There is no policy anywhere in any photo archives about what can and cannot be posted on the web. Um, it's all kind of gut, it's kind of instinctual. And I think that's also something that we need to think about, maybe try to come up with a more um, uh, coherent policy. <clears throat> so you see these shoes um, in this photograph, and this evokes um, what we know of the traces of victims, how they're memorialized. If you've been to Auschwitz-Birkenau State Museum, um, you've been to other museums in Germany, as was mentioned yesterday, one of the speaker, one of the questioners said, well, um, right, I was at this museum and all that's left are, are the shoes. And so when I looked at this photograph, I kind of zeroed in on these shoes and thought about how individual they are, how they get passed around, um, after the killing actions because they're valuable in a place like Ukraine. Um, and where do these shoes end up? <clears throat> the landscape is so important to how we understand, especially the so-called Holocaust by bullets, that the experience of victims until the very end, I mean, their whole, the whole, you know, the, 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 the degradation, the, pro the persecution that occurred be it from when the Germans first arrived in Ukraine in 1941 and started to institute these horrible measures, stripping them of their homes and of their belongings, bringing them into ghettos, um, assembling them into uh, this, the marketplaces, and often just marching them to the edge of town and, and subjecting them to these mass shootings. And for those who fled into hiding places, how much the landscape, how much agency there was and experience there was in the nature around them, in the trees, in the ravines, in the rivers, and in the hiding places in the forests. This is also um, a part of this photograph. Um, it's an embankment. It's a, uh, the landscape you can see here is, is dug out or it's kind of coming in at a slant. This is the light coming, it's not light as you would, might think of it coming through trees, it's both the light coming through the trees and it's also smoke. And this smoke is telling us that something's happening here. This is one of the um, perpetrators at the scene, German order policemen from Unit Orpo 303, which was attached to Einsatzgruppe C, <clears throat> which swept through Ukraine in the summer of 1941 um, and was largely responsible for the first wave, excuse me, of um, shootings in, and in the kind of beginnings of the Holocaust, the mass murder phase of the Holocaust as it occurred in, in Ukraine. And much of this was perpetrated by what Christopher Browning calls these ordinary German men, these ordinary policemen. Um, I don't know the name of this individual. He could have been a traffic cop in Hamburg or in Munich, and then he was sent out to the east. He's not a kind of elite special forces man. This is his job. This is his comrade. You can see his head is cocked. He's in a certain position. And this is also someone on the scene. Ukrainian policeman. You can't tell in this particular shot, but he's wearing an army that had been taken off of a Red Army soldier and given to him, and that becomes his new uniform under the Germans. And here we have the ensemble of the two Germans and the two Ukrainians and the gentleman over here who's observing with this cap on. And if you look closely, you can see the rifle. Uh, I believe this is a Russian army issued rifle and it's extending all the way back to this Ukrainian man standing, standing in the, in the, at the end here. And here we have a mother and child. Um, and you can see the ends of the rifles, and now you can start to see what's happening here with the smoke. And I'm, 
This is one of the worst photographs um, I've uncovered. So I'm kind of introducing it to you bit by bit. It's very disturbing. And, you know, really, it's what we have. This is um, ultimately a, a very <clears throat> clear piece of evidence of what the Holocaust was, certainly in Ukraine and other parts of Eastern Europe. There's a lot of literature now coming out about, or not a lot, but an interesting um, development in the field. I was speaking with colleagues about it last night, having to do with motherhood um, and motherhood in the Holocaust and this reality of how women and children were selected out and how they experienced, could it be, it could be at Birkenau, you've probably seen the, the, heard about the movie or read the book Sophie's Choice, that there is something important about the, the history of the Holocaust that concerns on the victim side the attachment of mother and child and mother and child being selected out. And what does that mean for the child, for the woman who doesn't really have a choice? Um, and is, is this a heroic moment for the woman who sacrifices as a mother with the child, for instance? Um, how, do we, how do we make sense of this? We tend to put a kind of heroic, um, a kind of halo on women who did this, but I think there's something, there's something more to the story in the way we're putting a gloss on it because it's clearly not an image that evokes, um, in my opinion, a kind of image of, of, of kind of heroism. And so here is the full photo. This summer, I went to this site. Now, when I first looked at this photograph, I thought that that had been dug out, that ravine. Because this was typically what happened in Ukraine. You know the story of Babi Yar when the um, victims were forced to dig their own graves. And I was walking around, whoops, some of these phones on. I was walking around with materials from um, uh, the archives related to this particular massacre, which is in Maropol, not far from Jatomer. Once again, I find myself in the Jatomer region. Um, and it's not far from Maropol, uh, from Jatomer, in the town of Maropol. It was October 1941 in a public park. And I had the documents um, from an investigation that showed the general layout of the town and where one, you know, how, how to potentially find this location. And um, I was walking in the forest with my colleague, trying to find this place. And we were going down the road, and this woman was driving, and she stopped her car. We kind of motioned for her to stop. And she got out, and we said, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to find this site from the war where there was this massacre in 1941 you know, of, of Jews uh, from the town. And she was on her way to a birthday party, and she had a daughter in the back seat who was going with her, and they were all dressed up, and she had on a dress and no stockings, it was in the summer, and high heels. And she said, I know this site. I'm gonna take you there. My grandmother was here during the war. I'm gonna take you there um, because uh, she was here during that time, and she, she remembered that event. She wasn't actually there, direct witness, but she remembers the event. So she gets out of the car, and, and, and we start walking, and she's walking through this, through nettles and um, in the mud, and I'm following her with my camera, wondering where is she taking me? This is, this is a spot. And she stops and she says, we're here, and I look down at this. And I said, well, what do you mean? I'm, uh, here, this is it? You can see the nettles and all the garbage. And she said, no, no. She said, look up. So we were standing down below, and this, here's the side. We, we climbed back up. And this is not a site, again, this is why the terrain is so interesting and so important. It wasn't dug out. 
This is a, this is sand erosion. This is a sandy riverbed. This is right along the Slooch River. And that ravine is just a natural, um, you know, it's nobody dug it out. It's just the way the landscape is. See, now here's another angle from the same spot where that picture was taken. And then when you come out, from that, le from that landing and come down, you're at the river. There's a river in the distance. And um, you can't see, I can, can't zoom in, but that day was the day of Ukrainian independence. It was a national holiday when we were visiting. And there's a gentleman there, and you can't see right here, but they're playing ball. It's one of these big uh, inflatable balls. It's colorful. And, so it's just very interesting and strange trying to come out of that scene and see all these people recreating and picnicking. There's the, see here you can see the erosion there hasn't changed. And the river's down here. What is the point of exhibiting these pictures? to awaken indignation, to make us feel bad, that is to appall and sad. And that's what Susan Zontag asked in her book, Choosing Not to Look, which was published in 1973. To help us mourn, is looking at such pictures really necessary given that these horrors lie in a past remote enough to be beyond punishment? Are we the better for seeing these images? Do they actually teach us anything? Don't they rather just confirm what we already know or want to know? Susan Zontag believed that such photos and the shock of atrocity photography wears off with repeated viewings, that we become desensitized. Photography has done at least as much to deaden conscience, she argued, as to arouse it. I respectfully disagree. The risk of desensitization to such photos exists where we have not knowledge of the photo's history and content. A photo can acknowledge and document events, but it cannot explain them. Seeing and looking from different vantage points at the crimes as witnesses, this evokes all kinds of moral dilemmas and, and emotions. In Germany, there have been exhibits on how Germans photographed the atrocities in the war and how they experienced it through the lens of cameras. And it turns out that the German film industry, like Agfa and Leica, heavily promoted experiencing the excitement of the Nazi revolution and conquest in the East with a snapshot camera. The First World War had spawned this bourgeois scenario of the living room with the vitrina and the photo album on the table. Snapshots and postcards were sent from the front. And many Germans took photos of the atrocities in this tradition. They experienced the events in the Eastern Front in the photos that sons and husbands sent or brought home. Thus, witnessing recurs every time we look at such photos and try to make sense of them. The history of witnessing and complicity is tied up in this photograph, in this photographic medium and snapshot culture. So, today I want to make a few points about this photo, about its provenance and features, and then about its relationship to the history of collaboration and as evidence in the pursuit of justice. What is the story depicted in the photo? What is behind it? What are its origins? As I mentioned, the photo was taken in the town of Mirapol. What do we know about Mirapol? In the Encyclopedia of Jewish Life, before and during the Holocaust, we learn that Jews were first mentioned in 1721, but were probably present earlier. This is the location here. Over here. Novgorod Volinsk is here. This is where Annette Shuking Holmeyer was, was last night. I was talking about her. Here's your Talmar. Shepetivka. Uh, Rovno is in this direction. Melnitsky. Vinitsa's down here. Here's Berdichev. Belarus. The border of Belarus is up there to the north. Here's the town, um, 
the center of town as I saw it this, this summer. This is a memorial to the Second World War here. Pretty desolate place. Look, you can see a bottle of champagne of Soviet, that's Soviet champagne. That was not mine. It was, I found it there. Um, although Soviet champagne is quite good, actually. Um, and here's going into the town. This is the, what was the police headquarters. Um, and Jews were held here before actions. And I went, you can, the, the, the prison, the actual jail. So this is this window here. In 1897, the Jewish community numbered um, 1,912 out of a total population in the town of 4,000, so roughly half the population in Mirapol was Jewish. They owned flour mills and a factory for felt blankets. The tzaddik, um, by the name of Dovidil, resided in the town. Jews were attacked in the 1905 disturbances and in the Civil War. Um, in December 1917. The Jewish population dropped to less than 1,000 between the world wars. In the 1920s, most Jews were artisans or laborers. A Jewish school existed there and a kolkhoz was active there through the 1930s. The Germans arrived on July 6, 1941 and began to murder Jews in um, August uh, 1941. The Encyclopedia of the Holocaust, a Russian um, encyclopedia by Ilya Altman, published um, in 2009, also has an entry on Mirapol and tells us that there were 142 um, Jews there um, in 19, or sorry, 1,400 Jews there in 1931, and more specifically that the Germans occupied the town from July 6th until January 6th, 1944, 41 to 44 and that the Jews were forced into a ghetto in town, and the killing started, um, again, agrees in August. SS units carried them out, uh, as I mentioned, Einsatzgruppe C, and the units of the higher SS and police leader along the river Slutsch, along this river. Another massacre occurred in September, um, and the one that is depicted in the photo that I showed you is from October, um, and in that particular action, 94 persons were killed, um, almost entirely men, or excuse me, almost entirely women and children, which is why I'm trying to figure out, because the list of women and children, why we have these shoes here, because to me they look like they're too, too large for that little boy. Um, they look like men's shoes, so I'm not quite sure, and maybe you can suggest a reason for that, I don't know. <clears throat> We have some important Jewish testimony on uh, Mirapol. The post-war testimony of survivor Ludmila Blechman in a wartime report of the Ukrainian Nationalist Organization, the OUN, describe and concur that the Ukrainian militia carried out a mass shooting in the summer of 41 and in September. More shocking to Blechman than the behavior of the drunken militia was the reaction of her neighbors. As she recalled, when the Jews had been gathered, the Jewish men, quote, decided to break through the police cordon and let people escape from the main square. The stunned militia was thrown into disarray and many, including Blechman, were able to escape, but few found refuge in Ukrainian homes. Blechman heard a Ukrainian peasant woman yelling from her window, quote, Mr. Policeman, a Jewish kid ran into my house. I saw him. One could also hear reactions to the plunder, exclamations about finding a nice coat or a good singer sewing machine. As the Jews were assembled at the square, they were forced to walk through the cordon of locals who tried to grab their bags and threw rocks at them. The memories of Ludmila Blechman persistently emphasize the critical role of the Ukrainian auxiliary police, as well as unexpectedly the hostile and treacherous behavior of her former neighbors. Selections and killings were carried out only by the Ukrainian policemen, Blechman recalled. There were no Germans um, in the actions, although this image that I showed you shows the Germans. She could be referring to an earlier, the earlier actions, I'm not sure. The policemen followed German orders. They got drunk before and during the actions. The policemen had a table with strong beverages and bottles on it, and they set it up in the Potosky Park. Periodically, policemen were running up to the table, had a shot of rum, and went on to shoot people. 
One policeman complained, I got my finger swollen. I have killed 50 by now. The finger needs to rest. They carried out the action. This is Blackman's testimony. I shall never forget, um, Blackman relates, how many traitors there were. I shall never forget that enormous evil. Uh, Lud Ludmila gave her testimony in 1986, 1997, and 2002. The first time she gave it in 1986 was in um, conjunction with a trial. She was uh, summoned by the KGB to provide her testimony. The second was in 1997. She gave it to the Spielberg Foundation when they started to, um, uh, you know, they, they were very present in Ukraine when I was there in the 90s. Um, so they successfully collected a lot of testimony in the East, in former Soviet Union. And then in 2002, she made her way to, uh, she had made her way to Israel and she gave a video testimony um, at Yad Vashem. And this brings me um, to the case of 1986. Remarkably, the gentlemen, the Ukrainians who are in that picture I showed you, were actually investigated and tried by the KGB in 1986 and 1987. Um, this case, I just found out, I mean, I had looked at the photograph and I found out that there was a case about Maropol. I wasn't sure if it was, there was a connection between the case and the photograph. Um, and then I was really fortunate this summer, um, I guess as I could say, <laughs> I struck gold this summer in the archives. Um, I was at Yad Vashem and uh, this material had come in. The uh, Israelis had successfully gotten at it at the KGB archives. It's not public domain yet. They just shared it with me. That's why I wanted you to not record this. Um, but my book won't be done for a couple of years, so by the time it's done, all of this should be uh, uh, properly, you know, the, the rights will be secured and so forth, and I can publish this. Um, it's over 2,000 pages of material on this on these killers who were um, uh, the perpetrators in that picture. In July 1986, one of the policemen pictured in the photographs was arrested by the KGB. His name was Rubach. He grew up in the region about 40 kilometers away from Mirapol and Khmelnytsky. He had a seventh grade education. He volunteered for the police forces in the summer of 1941 and assisted the Germans in mass shootings that summer and fall when most of the Jews were killed. He testified that he left the police forces in 1942 and joined the Red Army and married in 1949, became a carpenter, and retired in 1985. When Rubach was arrested, the secret police confiscated a few items from his home. What were they? A military ID that certified that he was a member of the Soviet partisans during the war and active in Moldova and that he was a war veteran. They also found a medal with military honor, honor, so he was a decorated veteran of the war. He participated in the Red Army Siege of Budapest. Rubach had not been arrested before. He had two daughters. Another man in the photo arrested in the investigation was a man by the name of Lesko, and he was born in 1922 and also had a seventh grade education and no prior convictions. He was caught, they caught up with him in Donetsk in eastern Ukraine. Um, in 1986, in September 1986. Investigators, by the way, um, the prosecution team was led by a Jewish man, um, so they were being prosecuted by a Jewish KGB agent. Um, they interrogated Rubach and Lesko and determined that they had participated in the shootings of these Jews, and they confessed to shooting. Lesko actually confessed to shooting a Jewish woman with his gun in mid-October. With this confession, Soviet investigators decided to prolong their work until December 1986. So this all started in July 86, at least the arrest portion. And they sketched out a plan. Um, they, they, I enumerated three goals for the um, next phase of the investigation. To reconstruct the park shooting, but go back to Maropol and reconstruct what happened by finding local witnesses. Um, secondly, establish a full account of the events and what happened, the actual murder and to study the personalities of the accused. In the course of their investigation, they found another member of the police named Gnachuk and interrogated him in October 1986. He was very cooperative and forthcoming um, and joined them when they went back to the murder scene 
um, and just and point it out and show them what happened. In this case, we find photos in the file of Ignatik leading the investigators to the crime scene, pointing out where people stood, the different positions, um, explaining what happened, and details such as where he stood when he shot. Ignatik confessed to being a member of the police and to shooting six Jews in Maripol Park. Of the three defendants, two, Ignatik and Lesko, were executed. They received the death sentence and they were um, killed in 1987. Rubach got 15 years, and he was released in 1992, one year after Ukraine got its independence from the Soviet Union. With this information, as I, as I mentioned, I did go back to the town because I suddenly had in my hands um, the sketches, Inatuk's uh, drawings of where they were walked through town and it could be kind of more easily plotted and I could reconstruct the events more uh, with this information. Um, I found myself at the time transported with this material, with this photograph, kind of brought back into time, but I realized that I was not at the beginning of the story coming at what I was coming at the story from various midpoints, and this is really how Holocaust research happens, and research in general, you open up a file and you find a photograph. That photograph was mixed in with a, a collection of materials on Jewish organizations, over 400 boxes of material on Jewish organizations during the war, and that photograph was kind of shoved in there. So we always coming at material kind of midstream, um, not from the beginning. The traces of the past are not, not neatly laid out for us when we uncover them, nicely ordered and complete. What is the larger context of this story of why these people were arrested in 1986? You know, why the KGB? What kind of a trial occurred? Were they publicly kind of humiliated? Was it a public execution? Um, was it part of a growing awareness in 1986? Think of Glasnos and the, the Soviet Union is basically imploding. What it, you know, why, why this arrest in 1986 when the events occurred in 1941? Why did they try to track down these killers and actually um, meet out these convictions? The post-war justice against Nazi perpetrators in West Germany has been fairly researched, but there are few studies about trials in the former Soviet Union um, that have been completed. We have articles that focus on the decade following the war when most of the cases were tried, um, including one on the Soviet role in the um, Nuremberg Tribunal. But the lesser known case of trials in Ukraine, we have very few articles and publications. One scholar in Germany has been um, pretty, uh, uh, has accomplished probably the most at this point on that. Her name is Tanya Penter, um, and she looked at trials in, in Ukraine against so-called homeland traitors and accomplices. Um, and she found that most of the collaborators um, included in their profiles some time in the Red Army. That seems to have been part of the pattern, that many of them participated in their earlier actions. And then maybe um, for whatever reason, we can talk about that, they joined the Red Army. It could have been because they were seeking kind of a cover or they realized that there was no future for them in the Nazi regime. Um, in any case, this is usually part of their profile. Um, and most of them did not have uh, any serious involvement with the Ukrainian national movement. The number of collaborators is very significant. Something between 90, you know, some 93,000 persons, 93,600 persons were arrested by the NKVD um, and charged with collaboration with um, this particular uh, crime of, tra of being a traitor to the homeland in the, uh, between 1943 and 1953. Thousands were charged for committing crimes against Soviet citizens, and most certainly against citizens of Jewish nationality. The Jews are identified in these documents by their nationality. It's difficult to determine with much precision how many of them um, were convicted and their sentences, but it, it's, it's a large number, and it points to a cache of material that has hardly been touched by the historians and has a lot of valuable um, information about the history of the Holocaust. Ukrainians and other ethnic groups um, who were arrested for collaboration accounted for one-third of those arrested across the Soviet Union. And when we compare this to Germans 
who were tried in the two Germanys and Austria in the entire post-war period, the fact is that the overwhelming number of persons convicted for committing crimes related to the Holocaust were not Germans and were not tried in German courts. In contrast to non-Soviet trials in Western Europe, almost all the Soviet Ukrainian ones ended with a conviction. There were very few acquittals, about two to three percent. Convictions were equated with a successful legal practice. This was all part of the Soviet campaign to professionalize the legal system while preventing the profession, um, any, the legal profession, any autonomy. During the Second World War and its immediate aftermath, two institutions were assigned the task of investigating the crimes committed against Soviet citizens by Germans and their local collaborators. One was a system of military commissions originally instituted by Leon Trotsky shortly after the Russian Revolution. As part of the central political office of the Soviet armed forces, this commission became a powerful element of every division in the Red Army by 1940. The other outfit was the Extraordinary State Commission for the ascertainment and investigation of crimes committed by the German fascist invaders and their accomplices, whose origins date to November 1942. Now much attention has been paid to the trial in Krasnodar in 1943 against Ukrainian collaborators because the Soviets made a lot of use out of that. It turned into a big propaganda event. They took film footage and the film footage was brought, you know, was distributed across various movie houses. It was a moment of, you know, revenge. It was 1943. They were also using this trial to um, inspire soldiers uh, in the Red Army and normal civilians, you know, to fight that much harder to, to, to vanquish the Germans, defeat the Germans, and to rise up behind the lines of the anti-partisan movement. So that trial became very important for the history of Soviet propaganda and the early history of justice. Yet even before this event in December 43, um, which is also often cited as the first trial, um, at least 16,000 um, Soviet citizens had already been tried by military tribunals for betraying the motherland, and a large number of these in 1942. Stalin um, issued several new laws, new articles to the criminal code during the war to uh, kind of facilitate all this, to make this happen, to put this in motion. Article 58 on counter-revolutionary activity and Article 59 on crimes against Soviet citizens um, in the criminal code of the Russian Soviet Federal Socialist Republic. He added to the, what was added to the criminal code, which is very important, is collective punishment. Collective punishment against entire families of collaborators, regardless of their locations in the Soviet Union, was officially codified by a special decree in July 1942. And in the Ukrainian criminal code, paragraph 54, this was basically the same. So the other republics adopted this code, which became this famous Ukaz, this decree 43, applied across the Soviet Union against German war criminals and their collaborators. And typically, those who were sentenced under this decree were not executed, actually. I mean, there were the show, these very visible trials of, of Ukrainian policemen uh, who worked for the German Gestapo office and so forth. But in the more general um, phenomenon was people were rounded up. You could be uh, working in a German office as a secretary, you know, or an Ostarbeiter. Any kind of affiliation with the Germans um, made you susceptible to this decree. Most people got 15 to 20 years hard labor, labor for being a civilian accomplice. This is the sentence that Rubach got. Although he confessed in 1986 to shooting, he got that same, that was the sentence he got, 15 years. Um, as the Red Army advanced toward Berlin and reoccupied Ukraine, Soviet kangaroo courts judged entire villages. They were condemned as collaboration nests. Inhabitants were rounded up en masse, some were killed and others deported. The brutal chaos of revenge justice gave way to later trials that were less frequent but more formalized and drawn out. The trials did not open up research on the different forms of collaboration, political, economic, administrative, and genocidal. Instead, the Soviet pursuit of war criminals and collaborators was simultaneously a campaign of revenge, consolidation, and legitimating the power and legal basis of the state. And for many swept up in the dragnet, another round of terror, but certainly not a mark in this new post-war era of political liberalization. These were not trials about the Holocaust, per se, the crimes were used, um, uh, the, 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 the Jews as victims of the crime were kind of used in a way instrumentalized for other political 
objectives. POWs and Ostarbeiters were among the masses arrested, and more intense for, uh, hunts for Ukrainian nationals were carried out in western Ukraine, all of them branded traitors or deserters. Some of the earlier literature on Soviet trials, including the one on Krasnodar, tried to argue that, um, like the show trials in the 1930s, that a kind of uh, ritual developed in the courtroom, a kind of culture of um, adjudication. Uh, I'm talking about the work of uh, Bortman, um, Ilya Bortman's uh, essay in Holocaust and Genocide Studies. He says that the lasting effect of the trial in Krasnodar established a set of roles that participants in subsequent trials were expected to perform. And I, I read that in, with interest because I thought maybe in the case of Rubach and Gnatik and those Ukrainian police in that photograph, I was wondering if in fact they were subjected to this kind of um, ritual or if they themselves kind of stepped into it. And Bortman argues that uh, the, the scene, the trial scene, um, always became a can become like a stage. Um, and who are the characters? We see the apologetic and self-denouncing defendants um, to the largely inconsequential lawyers, the stern and ruthless prosecutor. Each actor had a scripted part to play, just as important as the trial itself, and not, if not important, Portman argues, was the coverage it received. Large numbers of people who came to see the executions underscored the increasing psychological impact of the Soviet war crimes trials. In Krasnodar, the public execution of the defendants, the, the carrying out of their sentence, was attended by 30,000 spectators. The, the Soviet press, including children's newspapers, reported every word uttered by the prosecutor. Film crews recorded the trial, and as I mentioned, edited segments were shown in cinemas around the Soviet Union. Now, Bortman argues that this model reappeared in the 1980s, but he doesn't actually deal with any of the trials from the 1970s and 1980s, so we're left wondering whether this early phase of Soviet um, justice was indeed a model for subsequent trials. Certainly the Soviet Union of the mid-40s and 50s was different from the 70s and 80s. How was this different from the history of trials, the defendants, the procedures, the verdicts, the publicity, um, in the post-Stalinist era, in the classic sense of historical analysis, where is the change in continuity in the history of trials, specifically in Ukraine? And this is where um, my uh, work on, on Maropol, I'm trying to you know, put this to the test to see whether or not these other trials and what the history of these other trials, whether or not that applies to Ukraine. And I have this other case study, and I'm just wondering if um, we want to go get into that or what time did I start? Okay, all right. So I'm not gonna get into this particular case study in detail, I'll just summarize it um, very quickly. Um, this is Mirgorod, not to be confused with Mirapol. Um, and this is near Poltova. This is on the eastern part of Ukraine. And I thought, um, and it's about the same, well, it's late 70s, early 80s. Um, also a case by the Poltava Military District Court against the Ukrainian police who participated in the killing of Jews in 1941 there, also in October 1941, and quite a, a, actually a larger number. Um, and my work on this case, and here, here, here's the um, Jewish cemetery in Mirgorod and the Palace of Culture, and I have the Palace of Culture up there because as Bortman found in his research, in this case, like Krasnodar, was a highly publicized event. And indeed, the defendants were brought in um, and convicted, and, and they were arrested in, in very kind of devious, devious ways by the KGB. They were trapped. There was entrapment. There was, um, the interrogations were, were clearly extensive. Um, and they were brought in and kind of contrite. Um, I spoke to the journalist who covered the trial um, and asked him what his impressions were, and he was writing up for the newspapers, the coverage. Um, he, he said, though, that they were not as obsequious. The defendants were not as... Um, uh, kind of, they, they seemed, he said they seemed bitter and resentful. There, were, um, uh, there was more bitterness there. They, they um, realized that, they're, um, that they were going to face um, the conviction, um, but they weren't coming in there with a, a, an attitude that, the Soviet, that they deserve this. Um, in any case, um, these, this was not only a, more, a very highly publicized trial, there was an exhibit in conjunction with this trial. Outside that palace of culture, you can see that wall around there. Well, in the late 70s, there was a glass display case 
where they would typically um, show you what was going on in the, you know, what events were happening, if there was an opera, if there was a concert. And in this case, because um, this was the biggest building in town and there was a loudspeaker system um, that it was connected to along the promenade, you could listen to what was going on inside and they set that up. And in the case on the outside, they actually had um, objects that they had taken from the mass grave site. Part of the uh, trial was um, an event whereby the defendants and the local community walked to the uh, mass grave site, which had a memorial, a, a memorial had been erected there, um, and a forensic, they, they went back in and they, for, for more evidence, they disinterred it, and they found objects, um, children's uh, toys and uh, uh, personal objects, personal effects and jewelry, and they um, put that out in the display case. And that's something that the local population, the local historian, people I witnessed or interviewed there, that's something they remember very vividly. They don't remember the names of the defendants, um, but they remember that visual, you know, those, those objects. The Ukrainian police lived in the same neighborhood in Mirgorod. Um, they were all interrelated in one way or another. Brothers were together on the squad. Um, they still, those families still live in that section of town. Uh, it was very interesting when I was there. Um, I went to the local Jewish community and involved them in this research. They were very obviously interested in this. And at that time, I also had some KGB material that they had never seen. It was very awkward because I had lists of names with, that had family names of people in that town, um, of witnesses and of defendants. And the, the head of the Jewish community said, I want to come with you and go into that part of town. I always wondered about that part of town. And we were standing there interviewing this Ukrainian um, uh, former policeman. And this, uh, the, the head of the Jewish community is standing next to me. And we're being very loud on the street. It was in the middle of summer. And these people just started to gather around us. What is going on here? This American woman, this Jewish man, and this man we know has this history in the Ukrainian police. It was, it was, it was quite uh, unusual, kind of surreal. Um, but this case from Mirgorod is very unlike the one in Mirapol, um, because the case in Mirapol was conducted um, very quietly. Uh, I mean, granted, it was a, it's a smaller town, and it, the event itself was smaller in terms of the population. Um, but uh, we can't, I'm just, you know, there's a difference. There's a contrast there. I don't, I'm not sure um, what to make of that. How did the Mirapol case get started? In the case of Mirgorod, it was the daisy chain. It was one policeman was arrested um, uh, also in eastern Ukraine, actually, Donetsk. And he ratted out another one of his comrades. And through interrogations, the Soviets were uh, ultimately able to reconstruct that unit. And they had a trophy document. They had captured a list of the Ukrainian policemen, uh, German personnel document. So they had this, and they were going around finding the people. And then the, the Ukrainian policemen were um, denouncing each other. And suddenly, they could reconstruct the unit. I don't know how the Mirapol case got started. I don't know why suddenly in 1986, this Jewish prosecutor in Zhitomir tracked down Gnatuk, tracked down Lesko for what reasons. But I do know that this photograph has nothing to do with why this case started. You may be wondering about this photograph, the origins of this photograph, and the photographer. This photograph, as I mentioned, was among over 400 boxes of information on Jewish organizations during the Second World War. And it was um, discovered in Prague at the Military Service, Security Service Archive. In 1958, a Slovakian photographer, Lubomir Skrovina, born in 1916, so in 1941, he was 25 years old, was called to testify about the discovery of some five photo prints and 66 negatives pertaining to atrocities during the war. This is one of the five photographs. He explained that he was part of a security division assigned to German Wehrmacht in the fall of 1941 and asked by the German SS police to assist in an action in Mirapol. His duty was to cordon off the area and serve as a guard. He agreed to the assignment and he appeared with his camera. 
Lubomar participated in the killing with his camera as an actor, voyeur, documentarian of an event worth seeing. That's what Susan Zontag writes. Was his act of photo photographing one of non-intervention? He chose to hold his camera, not a gun, to record what was happening, not to aid and the victims to intervene. He also encouraged what was happening. In Zontag's words, to take a picture is to have an interest in the things as they are, to be in complicity with whatever makes a subject interesting, worth photographing, including when that is in the interest of another person's pain or misfortune. And remember the language of the photographer who shoots and aims his camera and focuses and reloads. In this context, the camera is, as Zontag writes, a predatory weapon, automated, ready to spring into action against its unwilling subjects who are violated, being portrayed as they do not wish to be. In this setting in Mirapol, victims face the humiliation of the camera and the pain and suffering of the gun. This photo, was not available to the KGB in Ukraine. Perhaps the trial might have gone differently if they had the photo, or if the photo were available to the West Germans who investigated Order Police Battalion 303. As Susan Zontag pointed out decades ago, photographs furnish evidence. The camera records and incriminates. It serves as incontrovertible proof that a given thing happened. They show us the fact. This happened. These people were there. They also reveal certain truths that have been suppressed or subjected to political obfuscation. Ukrainians shot alongside Germans. They collaborated in the most intimate way, even though the Germans in no way valued Ukrainians and other Eastern European collaborators as their equal. But they shared a common anti-Semitism so extreme that together they murdered women and children at close range. Where justice was not done and left unfinished, we have historical research. Mirapol was more typical, a quietly handled case, indeed secretive. Witnesses summoned, protocols written up, extensive paper flow, as we see in any criminal investigation and trial. The KGB did not have that photo as evidence. We have it. We see that two of the killers were caught and executed, or actually three of them. But what, that does not complete the story. We have no biographies of the victims. The sylvan seen by the river, the steep walls of the ravine contain its own stories and mysteries. And our work in some ways is a race against time as that riverbed continues to deteriorate. Witnesses die, memories fade, and the new generations come to that same place to celebrate Ukraine's independence, leery of that overgrown area that people refer to, they revo that they avoid. I wanna just end with, um, I worked on this diary of Samuel Goldfarb, uh, which was written in 1943 in Western Ukraine. And there was an entry um, from April 1943 that really struck me um, uh, that I go back to all the time in my teaching and, and thinking about all of this, especially about the history of the Holocaust in Ukraine. Samuel Goldfard um, had already looked into the post-Holocaust world, and he saw it one, not as one that was not of reconciliation, but one plagued by vengeance and haunted by the landscape of mass graves. In his diary, he wrote, and I'm quoting, the tombs and graves of people murdered in martyrdom are ever increasing all over the country. Every village and town, every forest brims with graves looming from a distance as a historical lesson and a warning. Once the living witnesses are gone, then those graves will speak volumes. They will accuse the whole world with an eloquence a hundredfold mightier of having committed or having failed to act against the cruelest of crimes. Goldfard's words resounded in my ears this summer when I looked up from that ravine in Mirapol. Thank you. Okay. Um. So we can take a breath. And I'm really curious to hear from you. Um, now you may be a little bit more at ease with this, with this photograph, if one can ever be at ease with any such photograph. But to help me, to help me um, 
analyze this in a way that would be helpful or to get your feedback about whether or not publishing such a photograph is even acceptable. Um, if there's anything that you see striking in this photograph, in your knowledge of the Holocaust or just in general, I um, would really appreciate some, some leads from you. Of course. Um, I know you're a historian. How did you come about focusing on the Holocaust and the main theme? You know, where did that kind of come from? Oh, um. Yeah, I, um, in a way, I kind of fell, in, fell into it. I'm not, I don't have any personal connection to it. I'm not Jewish. Um, I have some, I have a mixed background, kind of German, Scandinavian, English background, and it's, you know, my family members emigrated to the U.S. in the turn of the you know, century, early part of the late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, so it's not coming from that place. I think it's probably, you know, it's, it's personal to the extent that the material is so emotionally riveting, and it's a human thing. I mean, I see this, and I'm just, we were talking about this earlier, Carl and I. Um, to look at something like this just makes me ashamed to be a human being. And I want to try to do right by it, right, in some way, seven years later, to write the history. And, you know, my main goal in this, really, the ultimate goal now, is to get that list of the victims and get the biography and restore the humanity of the victims. And so the book will be, I'm thinking, I mean, the way I, I, I have conceptualized it, um, each chapter will have a cutout and then build up to the last chapter, which shows the full picture. Um, and that each of these is its own story about the shoes and, uh, you know, the mystery of the shoes and the fact that our memorial culture focuses on shoes and what, wh why, um, as an artifact. Um, the importance of, of the landscape and uh, which I referred to in the beginning, kind of the environmental history of, of all of this. Um, this, the mass graves, that reality, um, the Holocaust by bullets, the German perpetrator, the ordinary policeman with the Ukrainian. I mean, this scene right here of, when you talk about collaboration, you know, the intimacy of them standing together like that with their guns with nothing really, they're speaking different languages, right? They're coming together at the scene. Um, and to do this, you know, against a woman and a child <laughs> is just, the, to me, just the ultimate representation of, of, this, of this horror. Um, so, and what do we do with that in terms of our sense of justice and how to reconstruct it through the legal system, and then as, as historians, what happens to these people? Who were they? How, how can we ensure that all this wealth of information gets to the younger generation? We know that the baby boomers that grew up after the war during the trial period for a couple of decades, as well as the, the parents of the baby boomers who actually lived through the time of the war. So how can we get this information more directly to the younger generation so they will understand what has happened? You know, unless, unless they're taking a history course, they may not ever get exposed to it. I'm sure very few of them buy books like, like you were right in your, mm -hmm. your, your co-workers. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there are different institutions that happens at different phases over time. I wouldn't necessarily say we've got to get the young people um, some of the subject matter, like this is not appropriate for a very young person. I think people come to this history, we hope, we want to, we want to make this history available to people at different stages of their lives. 
because they're also processing their own kind of responsibilities in their lives and what, how, to what extent does it become part of shaping their character and their moral sense and sensibilities and empathy. So for instance, you know, you look at a place like the Holocaust Museum, a public institution in Washington that's part of the landscape of going to the Capitol on a field trip, and you have Daniel's story of something that's very specific to that age group, or you have something in the classroom that's very specific to that age group. Um, one of the problems I've seen is that, you know, there's a kind of saturation point. At, at, it could be at elementary or secondary educational um, uh, high school, and then, there's, and then it's not fostered at the university level. That's the problem in Germany right now. They focus so much on secondary ed, they've got nothing going on at the university when, you know, what a wonderful time, an informative time um, in your life uh, in your, when you're 18 to 21 and in a setting, an academic setting like this, to sit around and, and spend hours talking about Primo Levi and trying to make sense of that, right? You don't have that luxury when you're younger. Uh, you just have these kinds of encounters, but you're not really, uh, in, I think, equipped to kind of um, delve into them with the same level of, of understanding. So I think it's not necessarily of how can we get like a particular age group aware. Um, I think that happens, especially in the United States, through various means, through mass media, um, through some of the books that come out, Anne Frank, um, Knight. I think it's more the challenge of, um, you know, generally keeping the history alive, but also um, incorporating it into the different kind of stages of your life, like having coming here and hearing lectures when you're, um, you know, a full adult um, in the classroom at the university level. Uh, because I think that so much of it is not, this, I've had this conversation with my colleagues uh, recently in the board of the center that I run, and we've been talking about how people come to the university and they study this intensively and then they go off into all these different occupations. Um, lawyers, you know, financier, big bankers, what have you. Um, and it's not part of, um, it doesn't continue to shape who they are in their adult world that they compartmentalize like, oh, I'm interested in this, it's kind of a hobby, um, and now I'm gonna go on in, into the real world. And we've been just talking about how um, to reach out to our alums, for instance, and continue to connect with them on, on some, of these, some of this history. So I think it's, it's a multifaceted kind of endeavor, endeavor, but it doesn't happen naturally. Just a piece of information. My wife and I are from Australia. My wife is a Holocaust study, but in our senior high schools in modern history, Holocaust studies is part of the service, which is very pleasing. Yeah, Australia is, gr is great for <laughs> Holocaust education studies. Monash University and other, yeah, it's really good. Yes, I, um, I have a two-part question. If you want to answer either one or both, I'll try to be brief. Because one I was going to ask last night, but over the rest of the time. Um, on today, you had mentioned about the, uh, the Germans, there was a low percentage of successful prosecutions. It's, and this may be way off. Does any of that? Was there, in your opinion, any tie-in with, unfortunately, some American pro-German sentiment, like when Patton's armies were liberating and, and the Germans would prefer to surrender the Americans than the Soviets, and, and even some Americans were so anti-communist at that time that there was, a, uh, I don't want to say complicit, but there were some Nazi sympathizers in America, unfortunately, I guess, even the army, can you say? And I just wanted your opinion on that. And, and on the Furies last night, I was curious if, if there was any connection. Like, I know Sobibor had Ukrainian guards. Mm -hmm. I don't know if they were SS or under the SS. Was there a similar type after the expansion of the war and lessening in numbers? Were there non German or non pure, quote unquote, Aryan women that were also allowed to <coughs> participate and complicit in the Holocaust movement? Were, were they not? necessarily allowed to reach high levels of trust. And thanks for the last Okay, great. Um, so there's a couple of uh, issues packed in there. Um, I'll start with the last one. There were no women in the Nazi system who had, who were in the ministerial level, um, unlike what happened in the Soviet system where some women had, you know, officially were part of the party, like Lenin's wife, for instance. Um, so there was a figurehead, the head of the women's the Frauenschaft, the NS Frauenschaft. So the NS, the party organization, the women's 
wing of that was headed by a woman who was very visible, Schultz Klink, um, had many children, of course. Um, but that was really a, uh, she was kind of a, you know, poster child. As you were. She was, it was all representative. She didn't wield a lot of, a lot of power, but she inspired a lot of young, ordinary German women um, within the party movement, so as an activist. And to that extent, she had a lot of power, but not power in terms of decision-making and policy-making um, about the Holocaust, for instance, not that, that level of influence. Um, the immediate post-war history, you know, you talk about the politicization of these cases, and they're all subject to kind of political contexts, including the Nuremberg trial, um, and real realities. Uh, if you talk to the lead prosecutor from the Einsatzgruppen case, he'll tell you, you know, there were 24 defendants. I said, well, why 24? He said, those were 24 seats we had in the dock. That was it. We could have put more in there. Um, and so in the initially, they went after, you know, the big fish and, and the direct killers and the highest ranking individuals like Goering and whoever was left. Himmler committed suicide. Hitler committed suicide. Um, but sure, those were political uh, events. And, and the Cold War really settled in very quickly. Um, to the extent that the Russians were kind of the new enemy, West Germany was going to be our ally, and the Soviets and the, and the Americans were really um, uh, competing for resources to fight this new war, and that included Nazi scientists, um, and even those who had, had criminal pasts in the SS, if they could be considered useful for the Cold War, then they were, um, Truman even um, signed on to that with um, Operation Paperclip, for instance, uh, then they were they were brought here or they were protected. Um, and when McCloy left, um, when the U.S. shut down its occupation administration officially in the early 50s, he amnestied, he pardoned a lot of these killers, including Einsatzgruppen, those who were convicted. And that set that kind of signaled to the West Germans that we were going to move forward and be allies in this new campaign, and and that you know. Um, Germans could be trusted in that regard and that they weren't going to pursue the criminals aggressively. And we handed over that responsibility to the West Germans in this case. Um, uh, and they, you know, obviously were not really keen on, you know, many of the, the Gestapo chief from Minsk, for instance, became the head of the secret police, the investigative unit after the war in Köln. You had some people who just continued in their occupations um, and they weren't going to go down and hunt down their own comrades after the war. And it was, so there's a lot of um, uh, continuity there. Um, so that was uh, as another trajectory. Um, and you know, these Soviet cases um, have their own political uh, context as well. Um, and I touched on that a little bit today on the talk in terms of the sheer numbers and how they were deemed traitors and particular groups were targeted, um, you know, extortion, blackmail, rough interrogations. But um, the reality is that many more individuals um, in the Ukrainian police, for instance, or guards who were in the camps, Ukrainians, Travniki guards like Sobibor, they were in fact identified and they were in fact hauled into the courtroom and they were in fact convicted, which is not the case in West Germany and in Austria. So the record of justice is much better in the Soviet Union, as horrible as you know the system was. Yeah. How would you compare the reaction of the Ukrainian population and its assistance to help the Jews survive as compared to the Polish population? <sighs> Uh, it's a really uh, interesting, complicated question. Um, well, there are different ways to measure that comparison. You have, for instance, a Yad Vashem, individuals who have been identified as righteous among the nation, and that's a whole procedure, an application procedure, but there's data there. Um, and I forget, I think the number of Ukrainian righteous is, is over 2,000 or so, and I'm sure the number of Polish is much higher. Um, you know, it's, rescue is, is, it's tricky because it opens up this whole complex of where is rescue possible, how is it possible, who has the means to do it, what is the setting, 
you know, urban environments are very interesting um, in terms of the ghetto population in, in Poland, which was not the case in Ukraine. If you have a German unit sweeping into a village, arriving July 30th, rounding up, carrying out a mass shooting within a couple of weeks, there's not a lot of time to, you know, kind of persuade somebody to help out or to find the opportunity to connect with a non-Jew and, and get, you know, and be rescued. Um, the story of rescue in Ukraine is more about going into hiding, people who fled the actions and went to the forests, to what extent local populations helped them survive. And we see um, in this kind of rural, in these rural settings, um, the uh, inconsistency that people were often allowed to survive, given some charity by one person and denounced by the next. So living in a, in a, in a, in a dugout in the forest on the charity of others for a few months, um, the winter hits, it's harder to get food, you know, what have you, and then they, someone else denounces them, and we have a police record from the Germans that shows this, um, for example. So it's, it's hard to compare the two, or to even, I don't even want to generalize about one culture being more likely to be um, philanthropic or, or engage in rescue activity and take that risk than others. I do know in the history of rescue in, in Ukraine that the Christian, the Baptist church, the Baptists in Ukraine, and Poles in Ukraine, so other minorities who had been threatened during the Stalinist period, there tended to be some affinity there, some connection, that, that Jews did find refuge in monasteries and convents and with some of these local priests who reemerged under the Nazi occupation had been persecuted. The Polish minority who had been persecuted by Ukrainians in certain regions, that they tended to side um, with, with, their, with their Jewish neighbors. But of course, we know the book Neighbors, right, by Jan Gross, and that tells a completely different story for rural Poland. So it's, it's really rather complex. I'm, I'm sorry I don't, I can't give you a, a, a <laughs> hard and fast answer to that. And that question. And this is the fault. We all know about the show trials in Russia. The trials in which people were accused of uh, treason and they were as innocent as you or I. And now these trials went on and on and on and somehow Many major figures suffered from it, and many ordinary people, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, mm -hmm. of people were put in jail, and uh, there was a whole invention about what they had committed. Now, we all know that people do admit that they have done just anything if they are beaten tortured and their families are threatened and so on. So what occurred to me for a second, for the first time in my life, what will happen in many years from now when we see these uh, terrible things that happened in Russia, but people will say that well, they were not Russians and all these Ukrainians and the Russians and other people who have been instrumental in killing that many Jews. That was basically an invention of uh, the Soviet system. And today, I mean, we know that all of this is a lie, as the various other cases in which we tens of thousands of people were put in jail were lies. This is a lie too. It just occurred to me in this moment. Oh, yeah. Well, um, a few years ago, one of the persons who was really um, important in the, so the KGB in Ukraine is now the FSB, I, was in charge of that archive, so had control over this material, was an apologist, and believed that all of this was kind of made up and doctored, and by the way, it's a Jewish prosecutor, um, and that this could not be, that the KGB was just a, a terror organization, and none of this information can be utilized. Um, and I was in a presentation in Kiev, and pe someone took that, some people stood up, um, and I was talking about collaboration, and they were saying, 
you're, a, you're just a puppet of the KGB. You know, what you're saying, okay, that photograph is pretty revealing, right? What you're saying, oh, it's, then, it's, then it's doctored, you know, or it's touch up, what you're, but it's in a Prague archive. What you're saying is, is, you know, a completely fabrication of the KGB, which is, an, it's all another form of denial, but in this case, it's directed against the Soviet experience, another form of Holocaust denial via the KGB. Um, and I said, well, no, the presentation I just gave to you is completely based on records that were held in Washington and in Berlin and in Ludwigsburg, and these are German records from the wartime period. These are things that the KGB never could get their hands on. So, I mean, the good thing is that the material is spread out like this, and so we can corroborate. We can take these documents and corroborate. We can find new things. Um, and, you know, for all the arguments that uh, the cynics would make in terms of the KGB, um, these are thorough investigations. They, call, they found that list I told you, their priority list, they basically fulfilled that. You can see it's 2,000 pages of material um, when they're talking to these other witnesses and bringing them to the scene and taking all these pictures of them standing there and pointing and um, this is what happened here. And, and, and we go back and, in fact, what they're saying is true. Dr. Lauer, have you been invited any universities or institutions of public learning in the Middle East to talk? <laughs> Are you suggesting something? You think I'm crazy? No. Uh, uh, no. Um, where uh, <laughs> interesting, yes. Let me let me think about that. Um, you want to come and bring some bodyguards or something? Or <laughs> you know, I know some people. Um, yeah, that's interesting. Hmm. Do you find it hard to speak in, uh, in Europe and in the United States? Um, huh. uh, well, it depends. It depends. There are certain sensitivities, definitely. I would say in Germany it's harder than, um, for certain reasons than, like if I go to the Netherlands. Um, or, or, yeah, yeah. I mean, but it's not, it's just being aware of your audience and what the sensitivities are and how to approach things in a way that would be constructive. Uh, but... So if you don't have any more questions, then I think that we should say thank you to Dr. Laura, and we should perhaps uh, talk, or at least go and, uh, <laughs> and uh, carry on. Perhaps a little bit outside. We still can ask, and please do ask any question you have for her. And otherwise, we just would like to thank her for her so wonderful.